Here now is Faith to Live By with Pastor Barber. So good to be gathered with you today around an open Bible to exalt the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In this world, there are many things that we do not understand, and there are trials and testings. There are circumstances which we would not wish upon ourselves nor anyone else. Here is the full group to sing, but in heaven we'll understand it better by and by. Bible has the answer. You have provided the questions. We search the scriptures in order to find the answers from God's holy word. Question number one, who is the prince of Persia in the Bible? I direct you to Daniel chapter 10. This is the only place where this reference is made and verses 13 as well as 20 and 21, the very end of the chapter. And we must consider that this is a mighty demonic power. In this same chapter, as, as numerous other places, both in Daniel and, and elsewhere in the scriptures, we have it declared, such as in verse one, in the third year of Cyrus, 
king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel. So there is a specific human individual, a specific human authority by the name of King Cyrus of Persia. But this is a different one. This is the prince of Persia. And we must consider that this is a power, that this is a demonic power, unseen, but yet his authority. Instead of using the word uh, prince of Persia, you might say a spiritual authority or demonic authority of Persia, because this is one who, Daniel is told, was restraining help from coming. Michael, one of the chief angels, being restrained from coming, having done battle with this prince of Persia, and Michael coming to the aid of Daniel, but then very quickly returning to do battle, just as there are archangels in heaven those fallen angels, they also have a hierarchy, or one person has said a lower archy, and they are in varying degrees of power. And here we have one that was very mighty indeed. Question number two, have you ever heard of progressive Christianity? I must answer that I have never heard that term uh, to the best of my recollection, but if I correctly understand what is meant by it, I would wish to have absolutely nothing to do with it whatsoever. Some years ago when I was reading books to my three daughters, they were still of that age, they're certainly not of that age any longer, I was reading children's books to them. We came across one book where it was mentioned about some bureaucrat who was all fussed and about rules and regulations and he was very caught up with progress and one individual within that story said i have seen progress in an egg it's called going bad very often the progress which is touted in this world it is not progress which leads us up. It is progress such as the egg, and it is a progress that goes bad. Progressive Christianity? I suspect that the Apostle Paul and all of the apostles in the New Testament would want to have absolutely nothing to do with it. Now, if it means that we as individuals are progressing in our walk with Christ, fine and good. We are told that we are to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. However, the Apostle Paul, when he was speaking especially to Timothy, and this was the first sermon I ever preached, was from 1 Timothy chapter 6, 20 and 21, back in my seminary days. Paul says at the end of his epistle, Oh, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you avoiding worldly and empty chatter and the opposing arguments of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and thus gone astray from the faith. Then all the way through 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, but I hold out to you 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 16, Paul again says, avoid worldly and empty chatter for it will lead to further ungodliness. And 23 of that same chapter, refuse foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing that they produce quarrels. And I leave you with verse, chapter 4, verses 1 to 4. But then finally, Jude, the little book just before Revelation, and verses 3 to 7, Paul says, or rather Jude says, Beloved, I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation. I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down 
to the saints, I appeal to you, I appeal to you that you contend earnestly, that you hold fast to the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. Do that, do that. Hold steady, my dear brother and sister in Christ, and the nonsense of progressive Christianity, let it fly by and prove itself to be totally not of God. Thank you for these questions. If you have a question, send it to us. Our mailing address, Faith to Live By, Box 426, Winnipeg, Manitoba, R3C2H6. Tim Sturby now comes to sing Thanks to Calvary. I would like to tell you about this brand new CD entitled, titled A Closer Walk. It contains 14 songs, some solos, duets, trios, the male quartet, 
as well as the full group singing two songs. I know it will be a blessing to you, and you can listen to it at your convenience. All of our resources of Faith to Live By are always sent out free and postage paid, and you are most welcome to call us, to write to us, and to let us know of your interest in A Closer Walk. Our mailing address where you can send your request this week is Faith to Live By, Box 426, Winnipeg, Manitoba, R3C2H6. Or call us toll free 1-833-367-3852. Also, our website, faithtoliveby.ca, has a means of you contacting us and letting us know you would like to have a copy of A Closer Walk. Now a song which is included on this new CD, A Closer Walk. Here is Matt Bowring to sing, I Will Sing of My Redeemer. I will sing of my Redeemer and His wondrous love to me on the cruel cross He suffered from the curse to set me free sing oh sing of my Redeemer with His blood He purchased me In Ephesians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul is giving us rich teaching on how that we are to walk as believers in Jesus Christ. And he takes us now, beginning in chapter 5 of Ephesians, verse 22, into various specific situations in which each of us may find ourselves. He has spoken generally how that, and, and imploring us, pleading and appealing, he speaks that we are to walk as wise, not as those who are foolish. We are not to be filled with wine, but we are to be filled with the Spirit of the living God. Now he begins a section where he deals with husbands and wives. He deals with children and their parents. He deals with even economic relationships, on-the-job situations in the first century. It was the situation of slavery and how that slaves were to relate to their masters. I think that translates very well. We have bosses and we have those who are working for the manager or the authority. We find principles, rich principles here, 
which we can apply to our lives each day. But we also find in here principles which, as the devil is wont to do, as he delights to do, there are principles which have been at times horribly distorted, and they have been used in a manipulative way, and it has come to the discredit of the gospel and the discredit of God's people. In verse 21, where we left off just a short while ago, Paul says, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Some people don't like any talk in the Bible about fear. But when we consider who God is and who we are, how that we have offended God, how that we have sinned against God, and that the judgment of God rightly, it's not a twisted judgment, but the condemnation rightly falls upon us. It is only right that we fear what could happen to us. Now we know that God has reached out to us in loving mercy, in the person of Jesus Christ. He has come in order that the wall of separation be broken down and that there be fellowship, that there be communion once again, and that there might be a beautiful relationship where that relationship had been marred and scarred and had become a hideous thing. The fear of Christ. Paul appeals to the believers that we walk daily in the fear of Christ. Now he comes in verse 22 to say, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. And he gives the rationale for why he would make such a shocking statement. Our world is very confused about what a husband is and what a wife is and what marriage is, in fact, if we go to the first century and to the principles of the Holy Bible. Paul, he builds marriage and he uses an example of marriage. He says, this is what is the relationship of the church between God and us. And this is the whole rationale. This is the whole imagery that we use. Paul says, For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. He himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Now note... Paul has just spoken what we have here, three verses. When he wrote this, he didn't mark out verses. Those, those came later. But simply note that a brief part is addressed to the ladies. Now, Paul really comes down and he directs his arrows at the men. He says, husbands, listen to this. Love your wives, not as you think is right and proper, but here is the measure whereby you ought to love that woman who stood at the altar with you and pledged her undying love to you. This is the manner, as Christ also loved the church. Wow! That is a heavy thing when you ponder and when you meditate upon that. How is it that Christ loved the church? He left the privileged place of glory in order to come into this world, in order not to ser be served, but rather to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Christ is our example, men of how that we ought to love most aggressively, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, the church, so that he might sanctify her, 
having cleansed her by the washing of the water of water with the word that he might present to himself the church in all her glory having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that she would be holy and blameless and Paul says it again he uh, did you miss it here I want to make sure you get this verse 28 so husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own body bodies he who loves his own wife loves himself no one has ever hated his own flesh but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ also does the church because we are members of his body Paul he's talking to the ladies and he's talking to the men but he's most especially talking to all of us of how that Christ so loved the church that he gave himself and in such a way ought every believer whether they be male or female that every one of us love one another for whom Christ died that we give of ourselves and that we expend of ourselves for the good of the other and Paul says for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh and he says the mystery is great but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church Paul is not primarily speaking of matrimony in this world he's first and foremost speaking of the glory of what Christ has done in his body the church and he says nevertheless each individual among you also is to love his own wife even as himself there it is the third time and the wife must see that she respects her husband oh dear friend what a privilege to be a part of the body of Christ and to walk with him and to know that we are heaven bound and that we are a part of what he is investing and doing in this world if you haven't surrendered to Christ come today if you have surrendered to Christ draw closer even today and rejoice in our great Savior There's room at the cross for you. Thank you for joining Pastor Barber today. Please watch for Faith to Live By again next Sunday at this same time on this same station. Until then, Faith to Live By prays that the peace of God will fill your heart and that the joy of the Lord will be your strength. Pastor Barber would love to hear from you. The mailing address is Faith to Live By, Box 426, Winnipeg, Manitoba, R3C2H6. 